Hi, this is John Reed. I'm at PowerPlex 2019 with Brian Summer. How you doing? Pretty good, John. Good to see you again. Yeah, definitely. We're going to do something a little different. This is the day before the Plex user conference kicks off in the cloud manufacturing realm, and we were actually just at an awesome hands-on tour of of College Park and Plex customer that's very heavily involved in in human prosthetics, which is a really inspiring area. They're and pretty much kicking butt too. So. Yeah, you and I have been at a couple of things like that. Uh, last, uh, about two months ago, you and I sat in on an Oracle uh, customer. Yep. Uh, it, uh, I think it was Industries for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. Love that stuff. That was an amazing story. And yeah. I'm not taking anything away from what we saw no, just no. a few minutes ago at Plex, but both of those are it's the great kind stories. of customer things that really, uh, really get to you. And yeah. for hardened analysts, that's pretty rare. Absolutely. So, but we're not here to talk about that today because we'll, we'll probably tape a podcast about Plex if we have time later in the week, but we're here to talk about your book, Brian. You wrote a book called Digital with Impact. Yeah, and apparently... After all I, these years, you wrote a friggin' book. Yeah, I wrote one, and I got to tell you, I was... Um, I wasn't out there consciously keeping it a secret, but it sure did surprise a lot of people that I actually wrote one. Yeah. For our listeners, just to understand what we're going to get into here, I'm going to I'm going to give Brian a hard time about a few things related to the book. He's going to defend himself, uh, but but <laughs> but we're actually going to actually going to get in in the later part of this little podcast into I think what's the heart of the book, which is that I see it as a workbook. I, I think that's one of the real differences in your book is that you you have a bunch of exercises you've used with customers on client sites to help them push digital from happy talk into like i guess you could say a discipline a way to transform your company um so we're going to get into some of those exercises later right so but the first thing i really want to start with is the transform digital transformation book field is something of a crowded space uh there might even be a few hucksters involved uh from what i can tell um so i was really surprised to see you dip your toe into the ring there what what motivated that well uh, I don't know how many of your listeners know this, but I'm actually a buy side analyst. I, I get most of my income, if you will, from helping clients solve particularly gnarly problems. And my background coming from Accenture, I'm the kind of guy that actually runs to giant, big, gnarly kind of things. So I've been in the middle of a bunch of these kind of projects. And, and what I was seeing out in the wild, if you will, bore no resemblance to these feel-good puff piece things you read in the business press all the time. And I also noticed in the business press we were seeing the same 10, 12 companies' uh, tra digital transformation stories being lauded out again and again and again and again. What I saw out in the world were not digital transformations. I saw a lot of digital misfires. And there were... And I didn't want to write a book that was a downer book that was all about, oh, look, here's another company that screwed up. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to actually keep digging in until I figured out what was that that they could, that they should have done differently and how they could do it differently and how they're going to get this thing going. Because at the end of the day, the shorthand of this is I saw way too many companies who tried to either shortcut the process or skip steps or what have you. One other thing I got to tell you, I, I ran into lots of companies who would go like, Brian, can you help us out with this project? And I go, what's what's the project? And I'd hear names like um, ERP modernization or um, factory of the future or, you know, or some kind of something transformation or whatever. And those are all nice. But the more I kept probing, I found out that a lot of folks had been, you know, um, they approach they weren't really talking transformation. Uh, they were talking about transformation the way you see it on those home improvement shows where mm. somebody goes, oh, John, I just love that blue accent color you put on the living room wall. It just totally transformed the house. It didn't transform the house. The house is still the same broken down thing it was. Now we're talking about bigger kind of things. The other thing that kind of surprised me about you getting into this topic is that, let's face it, a lot of the vendors that you have excoriated in recent years use this very concept of transformation to sell software, right? So mm -hmm. whether it's AI or AO, IoT or whatever you want to, even blockchain, whatever you want to throw in there, usually it's being pushed in the context of this notion of transformation and that the the idea being that vendor, software vendors know that if if customers get off their get off their rear ends and start pushing this transformation, they are going to need new technology. So, so they have a vested interest in pushing this. And so I'm like, wow. Brian's pushing this too. He must actually think that 
these transformation factors, like that, that, that the things that are causing this to happen are real, right? That, that in other words, that companies are in predicaments that they may not fully understand right now, oh. and if they don't act, there something something kind of bad is going to happen. That's basically what you're saying, right? Yeah, and and not to go negative, but the flip side of that very coin you're describing is unfortunately a lot of the old, old technology companies and partners that so many businesses have worked with for the last 20, 30, 40 years that, uh, you know, that they view as their trusted partner. They're not going to be the ones that are going to take you into the transformation, digitally transformed mm-hmm. age. Those are folks who have uh, too much invested in the past and have been too slow trying to move to help companies come, you know, really kill it out here and what they ra- radically need to do differently. This is a different set of kinds of solutions and capabilities and so forth. And if you're going to the same company that implemented your on-premise HR system thinking they're going to somehow digitally transform your enterprise, you're looking in the wrong place for help. You and I have had a bit of a back and forth on this in past podcasts, but one of the things that is really important to me is is to help companies steer away from these bog pit multi-year projects that they just don't have time for anymore. So many of these were navel gazing products in the past that may have generated some efficiencies, but not worth probably the expense put into them. And so now I think companies need wins. They need to build on wins. They don't have three years to say, I'm going to transform my company on every level. So do, do you think your book adequately addresses this challenge of like the overall transformation versus next steps? Like how do you see those two things? Are they in conflict? Uh, let's, there are some problems. I'm not going to gloss over it. Um, the, the first one, though, is for a lot of companies, they can't get to start. They can't even get these things kicked mm-hmm. off and going. And we could do 10 podcasts on that alone. Uh, but let's just put a stake in the ground and acknowledge that is a real significant problem. The second thing about, uh, I heard not just from you, but uh, several other people that were talking about, it, we've got to have these kind of things chunked up into uh, digestible pieces because either they can't get their head around the totality of a giant deal or they need from a, a, a moral, morale, excuse me, building kind of perspective. They need to have lots of small victories along the way. I'm, I agree with that need, that business need, but I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes you can't do that. Some of these projects are just so transformational that you you may have to go stand up a new site. And I'll give you a great example. Um, a colleague of ours, Vinny, uh, Vinny and I went to one facility and I was walking around as a manufacturing plant. I saw this scenario unfold multiple times where the whole thing is running at full production capacity right now. And the physical plant equipment was designed in 1959 back when they were making one and a half products a year out of this facility, big giant things. And now they're making things, now the size of the products has gone from like the size of a boxcar down to a a dormitory refrigerator. They're making these things in the hundreds, and it was never set up for that. I mean, now squirreled away in corners, they've got 3D printers and everything else. You can't stop this plant so that you can now wire it up as a factory of the future Because you would take it offline for weeks, months, maybe years, the company go out of business. And so I'm just telling you that I like the idea of breaking into chunks and definitely do it when you can't. But sometimes you may just have to go build an entire greenfield facility because you can't disrupt the current business today. Well, and and I do think there's something that goes hand in hand there, which we won't get into too much in this podcast. But I think there's also a way to have quick wins, but also have a broader scope where you understand, like, you're not – for example, building a customer-facing app on one platform and a supply chain visibility app for your suppliers on another platform. Now you have 40. Like there's a lot of architectural decisions you right. can make to help right. so that those wins stack up into something that resembles a strategy or, you know, so anyway. Well, yeah, we're both. I think we're both saying the same thing and that regardless, you better have a blueprint that really describes the the, the, the entirety of the whole effort, the program, mm-hmm. if you will. And yes, you can probably find ways to break it into discrete projects within it and get victories out of those along the way. Uh, So, yeah, we're we're beating, we're flogging this. Yeah, yeah. So, so with the the other really important distinction, right, is that there there are these kind of we talk about the things that you know whether it's whether it's Netflix or Google or you can even look at companies like Uber who have been able to achieve a fairly massive scale in a short time frame because of their market growth. 
these companies kind of have an advantage, right? Because they're the so-called disruptors. They're not carrying a huge amount of what we would call technical debt. Yeah. But a lot of the companies that I think you most want to get this message out to are not in that situation. They are carrying the legacy of past right. software decisions and arguably mistakes. Um, they have technical debt in the form of everything from over-customized ERP instances to data silos. I mean, there's all kinds of flavors. You talk about some of that in your book. I was even hoping, I think, for more in your book on technical debt. But you do cover a fair amount of what's holding companies back. So isn't that part of your message, too, that you can do this even if you have these problems? Yeah, you can do it. And um, uh, and you're right. I, I mean, I, I could have written an 800-page book, and people would still complain I didn't put enough in there. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, as it is right now, I already got... I've already had one request to see if I could shrink it down to the idiot's guide to digital transformation. It's, I'm holding it in my hand now. It is big enough to do some physical damage to someone, so it's not a oh, short book. On. It's like, <laughs> what is it, 250 pages? Yeah, no, like it's, it is a pretty quick read, I will say. But. All right, but, uh, but to the point about, uh, uh, you know, I, I, get, I remember going to one place, it was a, uh, again, another manufacturing example. This place had been in business since around 1909 in the same buildings that a family member, uh, somebody's grand, great grandfather had actually designed. And it was five different buildings and you had to, you know, and it was never set up for the kind of business that is really going on today. Uh, that's a, that's a physical infrastructure kind of technical debt. I run into more companies though that have a people skills technical debt. They don't, they just don't mm. have the folks who know anything about algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, chatbot technology, whatever it is. And the reason that's important is because how can somebody radically reimagine a process if they don't even know the first thing about the new innovations and technologies that go in it? And to your point, they could fall into a trap that you mentioned earlier, which is then they could call their old partner on the phone and the partner will say, Oh yeah, we've got plenty of AI people for you. And then you're back to the same. Yeah, you got what you were in. And the big danger with that is you're probably not going to get anything terribly new original. You're going to get the same thing they recommended to all, the last 20 of your competitors. It's not transformational. It's incremental. And that's a big, big no-no here. We're not trying to copy the Joneses here five years late. You need to get in front of them because the speed with which business is evolved and technology keeps changing. You cannot be doing this copycat stuff anymore. So I want to get into the exercises because I think it's really, really important in terms of thinking about what what's different about your book than some of the others is is that I do think there is this workbook flavor to it. And you have some you, you provoke questions, but these are also questions you've you've worked through with customers. So um, one of the ones that, that I was struck by is the power of innovation combinations, which is exercise seven for those who want to check it out. OK, um, but um, one of the interesting things about that, right, is that that when you combine these various types of innovations, you have whole new scenarios. I mean, you list things like everything from new business models to drone delivery capabilities to uh, gig economy, increased use of robots. Like there's there's all kinds of different trends that, that could impact companies together. And so you in the exercise, you ask them to take a look at these combinations to see what different collections of technologies and business models could mean for things like new product ideas, new customer capabilities, customer facing capabilities, et cetera. So how does that play out when you do this exercise with people? So one of the reasons I do it is because a lot of folks probably listen to this podcast, they just don't get the time to step away from the regular day to day job to actually really get down, peel the covers back and understand what all these new kind of innovations and tools can actually do. And but the danger in only looking at one innovation, if all I did was look at, say, chatbot technology, I keep thinking, OK, I got here's a chatbot. I'll have it answer mm -hmm. some of my, redu you know, um, low value phone call messages I get. But they're missing the big thing. And that is uh, if you think about, say, chatbot technology with artificial intelligence or machine learning and with some other something else, natural language processing, whatever, you imagine two or three, three of these things together, and then you apply that against a given process. And as you think about it, what, what the book is trying to get people to do is to actually think about the potential for what these new technologies can do, not 
wait for some vendor to spoon feed you something that's already been fully baked out and therefore is no longer competitively differentiating. It will not move the needle for you in the market. And I, I, I will share this with you. Uh, while I've had a lot of success with that technique, it's a great way to finally kind of break down people's old ways of thinking because everything they keep thinking about is I'm going to take chatbot technology and bolt it to the side of an existing mm-hmm. process. That's an incremental improvement. That's not transformational at all. Right. But then you throw in something like 5G into the mix and it's yeah. a whole, like, you have to figure out what the implications of that are. With chatbot technology right. yeah, yeah. on our, like, our, I don't know, order to cash process or something yeah, like that. Yeah. When I've done this, you know, it has an incredible ideation stimulation effect when you do it right. Where it didn't work well for me was at, at a show I did in uh, uh, in Asia a couple months ago. And had all these people working in teams of eight or ten around round tables, probably 150 people in the room. And I, and I gave them a cheat sheet even. I gave them a list of 80 different technologies and I just said, each table, just pick two or three of these technologies and then pick a process. And then I want you to talk amongst your team about how those three things could work together to radically, you know, uh, reimagine that deal. And I would describe it as an absolute bust. And the reason being that those people were more junior and clearly were at this, it was an HR show, they were there to for the first time to actually see what these new technologies were. This is the first time they'd seen like chat about bot technology or what have you. And I had to go by and kind of unstick these tables full of people that were all stuck. They could pick the technologies, they could pick the process, but they could not get into the ideation mode at all. Mm. Now, I just tell you this, folks, because digital transformation, you know, coming up with that idea, the, the, the new ways of radically rethinking your business, it, it's not going to be something that you just tear out a sheet of paper and just whip something out. You're going to have mm. to think about it. And that's what we got to get people to do more of. It sounds to me like the problem in your example you just gave where it went wrong is it was somewhat of an artificial setting in that sense where you probably didn't have the right combination of stakeholders around those tables, right? Is that part of the problem? That you and needed like more that senior and the, people and well, people from different. Yes, and, and this is an and a yes and and they this was the first time they've ever even took five minutes to think about. Oh, mm. what is chatbot technology? How could I use that? Because they've never thought about that. Mm. They were waiting for somebody to, ha- you know, basically serve it up to them on a platter. Mm. So are you able to take an exercise like that? And and I, I take it it opens people's thinking and then help guide them towards whatever that might be as far as it might be investment in some research or a prototype or some kind of project. Like, like how, how would you go from that to a project? Well, when in a different setting, when it's just with a client, um, all I have to do is basically provide the spark to get them mm-hmm. started. And then once they get kind of into that loop of realizing that on their own, they'll start looking up other kinds of technologies and they'll start thinking of new kinds of combinations of multiple innovations. And they'll start thinking about all the other places in the company that they could apply that. Mm-hmm. It goes really quick. You, you know, it's uh, I don't know if anybody remembers high school chemistry, but there was a thing called a catalyst. You know, a catalyst doesn't really get chemically involved in reaction. It just makes the chemical reaction really just, you know, accelerate. And that's what you need. And that's what I did. You also really like Exercise 11, which is we made the cover of Forbes. Oh, yeah. I love that um, one. And, well, Forbes is probably not my favorite publication. Well, especially it could be Fortune Forbes or Business Week. But, but, yeah. but having said that, like you're talking about, like, you know, the financial press as we know it. Maybe it's a Wall Street Journal. Fine. Yeah. But, but your point is that... What you want to do is get people to go five five years into the future mm-hmm. and 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 look at them achieving that kind of coverage and then they work their way back and figure out like how how it is that they're gonna they're gonna get there and you say here that that, that there's a huge power in creating that narrative um, because you have to really talk about the result but also the journey how you're going to get there so so tell us like how does this play out when you when you do it well I was using this technique before I found out about the science behind it, believe it or not. Ask backwards here. I kind of stumbled into something great. It turns out when you work your way backwards, you use a different part of your brain than you normally do. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is almost unblock 
all the other things that are going on, like in your company and all the other things you know are going on in the firm, you have to start like, okay, five years from now, we're going to make the cover of Fortune, Forbes, whatever. We did it because we are now, our company is now bigger than Amazon, let's say. So how did you get to be bigger than Amazon? And you have to start, you know, like you said, you're, you're working backwards from that narrative, but it also makes you focus on you quit wasting time and energy on a bunch of other projects that aren't going to do anything close to that. Those are distractions. Those are incremental little things. You're going to get rid of it. This project, this this activity is really interesting because you have to think it out. you got to draw it kind of like a reverse timeline, like, okay, five years, that's only 60 months. How do I, What can we do in 60 months that can make us bigger than Amazon? And as you start thinking that through and th- writing the narrative of it, then what you want to do is try and share that narrative with everybody else there and like the executive committee and watch what happens because people then, now they can see the destination. And that's one of the hardest things a lot of people have is they can't, you know, they can't put a line in the science in the sand and say, in five years, this will be us. Now, how do we marshal all the resources, resources of the firm to hit that particular X on the, you know, marks the spot kind of destination. Mm-hmm. Most companies do the opposite. They go, someday we're going to be bigger than Amazon, maybe. And they start thinking about a bunch of little itty bitty incremental deals and they'll never get there. You've got to go from the other way back and putting, uh, and do like I do. I always find who my client is. It could be like a, an, a director or something. I'll put that, the, his or her picture on the cover of the fake cover of the magazine article and pass that around the executive committee just to see um, how well everyone wants to support that idea. Right. So because you're using a different part of your brain in this exercise, is this exercise not challenging for some teams? Oh, it's a it's really hard for a lot of teams to do because most of them could not write and they cannot write like a twenty five hundred word article. Mm-hmm. And they can't they're not used to writing that kind of a narrative. It's just not in the business um, I don't know, psyche or skill set for a lot of people to do it. But if you soldier on through it, you can not only can you knock it out, but from that moment forward, everyone will tweak and tune that narrative because now they now they have they know where they want to go. The reverse is what I often find. It's a whole bunch of people that all are run around packing up suitcases and luggage for some journey or their company wants them to take them on. And they're all like running out to the driveway to get in dad's station wagon and nobody's packed the right stuff. They don't know where the destination is and they're all get ready to go on vacation with no idea what they're going to do. And that's mm-hmm. the general kind of thing I see all the time. And so when you when you go through that with with companies, what what is their takeaway after that exercise? What are they able to kind of do with that? Well, the book talks about three, uh, four main sections: see, think, reconcile, and transform. And this journey deal. Now that they see it, now I like this when you get closer to the reconcile stage because now you got to look at this going. Like, Man, I don't know. You know, I don't know, John. I don't know if we can get all. We can beat Amazon, but maybe, we, maybe in five years we can be number two to Amazon. Let's say, and you've got to look at realistically what can you get done with the resources you have. And if you don't have them, what are you going to do about them? Do you have? Are you going to raise more capital? Do you have to change your hiring? And there's a bunch of stuff you got to do. One of the things you may discover that when you're working your way backwards is you're going to find out like your company had to go hire another third new workforce that was nothing but all these like new age kind of skills and it had to come up with a whole new recruiting plan everything else to go get these people and if you know you're going to need them all like in year two then in year one you've got to be setting up the infrastructure and the campus relationships and whatever else to be able to get, feed that pipeline to get it done one thing that also strikes me is that you probably get people talking in ways that they're that they haven't talked before like correct and and, and that's important too because even if they get the kind of new kind of partner that you're describing, the real kind of advisor with with that next gen understanding, like I still think companies have to be able to have these conversations sometimes without expert facilitation, but just yeah. be able to carry them on. So it sounds like you can kind of, if this goes well, you can kind of spark them towards that a little bit. The one uh, real quick, when I did that on in less than five minutes after reading the article, mm-hmm. the the five year out article. They realized that they were doing a giant ERP project, uh, and Brazil was about to kick off. And they realized, you know, it's not tied to the future of where we're really going to go as a company. And they killed it. About a $70 million project got killed in less than five minutes because they realized it's not going to get us to the promised land. 
Yeah, there's one other really important point in your book that, that we didn't talk about, but we need to work it in real quick before I get to the Jeffrey Moore question, <laughs> which is uh, this this notion of technical constraints mm-hmm. that um, that for so many years we've been encumbered by technology, so that our, our visions of what we, even if we wanted to transform these new and creative ways, a lot of times we weren't able to. And and one of your positions in this book, which I pretty much agree with, is that a lot of those constraints are gone now. And I can certainly point to areas where companies are still struggling with everything from data integration to, if you, you want to say, okay, certain kinds of prescriptive analytics aren't there yet. Uh, but having said that, like the obstacles technically are so much lower the interesting thing, of course, is that puts a spotlight back on people and culture, right? So, Yeah, that's fair observation. And um, I think what a lot of companies have done, in a way they've done a disservice to themselves for the last 30, 40 years, as they kept using more of this constrained technology, it forced them to behave and structure their business and their processes in very um, in, um, uh, uncomfortable and... Uh, almost inappropriate kind of ways because they had to design the business around this highly constrained technology. So the processes really are aligned with technology constraints and around uh, 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 the bare basic transactions, and that's just not the way business works. And they were also internal primarily, too. Oh, yeah. Right, Right. because I I had the arrogance to start a newsletter in 1997 called Extending the Enterprise, which was sheer hubris, because obviously at that point the technologies weren't there to support, you know, looking beyond. But now they are, right? And so it's almost now as part of your exercises, I'm sure you provoke people to think about how those processes extend and how you would extend them. To customers, suppliers, or what have you. Well, you folks on the podcast can't see me, but right now I'm grinning like yeah. crazy because as John just described that, I actually I wrote about how there's two things you got to be able to do really well, and one is you have to be able to pay attention to what's going on in the market and know what kinds of like technology stuff are going to happen and what kind of changes are going to happen, business models are going to evolve, and so forth. That's the knowing how things are going to happen. The other part of the problem is knowing when they're going to happen. And the example you gave is just like some I put in the book where I had I predicted some pretty amazing stuff. Only I was off my 10 or 20 years on when they actually were going to come to fruition. And I keep working on that to get the timing right. I get I have the ideas. The concepts are down. They're tight and right. Mm -hmm. It's the timing is what I have to keep working. on. Yeah. Being a tech pioneer can be can be glorious in the history books like Xerox or whatever before Apple and Mac, but it doesn't. it's not how you cash in, certainly. Yeah, well... Um, but that's a whole other I, story. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, let's get, let's get to Jeffrey Moore before we wrap this up, um, because obviously Jeffrey Moore uh, wrote, wrote one of the most important books that has a bearing on this conversation in Crossing the Chasm. And then at the Oracle MBX show this spring, you had the opportunity to spend, I think, an hour with him? Yeah, it turned out... So how did that go? It went really well. Uh, Jeff wrote a book... Uh, that came out in 2017, and excuse me, I'm drawing a blank on the title of it right now, but it's a nice little, about 160-page uh, red-covered book. And the focus of his book is really around why large enterprises are really having a difficult time doing any kind of digital transformation successfully. In fact, the front end of his book he talks about, he can't hardly find any big ones that have done been very successful in transformation either. Mm-hmm. And... And I found that, frankly, validating, because contrary to the same business press that you and I were talking about at the top of this podcast, it's always so rah-rah, and yeah, let's do everything digitally transformed, there, the number of successes just really aren't there. He, his book's really about kind of how companies plan, budget, and manage the portfolio of all these different uh, horizon-based uh, initiatives. It's not set up well for large enterprises to actually succeed in transformation, particularly if some outside actor like an Amazon or Google, whatever, decides to suddenly jump into your space and now you've got to royally accelerate stuff up. And he talks about all the problems that happen when that occurs. Mm -hmm. So Jeff and I sat down. We had a great conversation. I was kind of sharing with him kind of the thesis. He had Zone to Win. That's his latest book. And um, Jeff and I, uh, we were comparing us between the two different approaches. I I came... uh, we both start with the same kind of uh, perspective that not all things people think and want to do around digital transformation are going to make it. And we both knew there were some significant challenges. He focused on a lot of the economic issue ones, which 
admittedly, I don't cover really in my book, and it, partly it just we we can't build gigantic encyclopedia sets full of books on this stuff. But uh, he doesn't cover some of the stuff of mine. They both actually dovetail very nicely with each other on these two books. Yeah, you mentioned something before we started taping about how the that that you can get caught up in that cycle where an Amazon type company disrupts you and your your R and T your R research and development gets all borked up and right. then and then you go into essentially a death spiral. Well that's because somebody comes into your space and decides you're gonna radically cut cost or whatever in there through like what happens to the cab industry when Uber gets into it, you know. All of a sudden, your business is going away. There's operating margin pressure like you can't believe. They start slashing and burning every kind of budget, including all the marketing and the um, R&D money. It just goes away. They cancel all kinds of R&D programs. And then whatever you got left that might have had a chance of competing if you're a cab company with Uber, it may have been only a partially completed, you know, a skunk works project. You try and rush that to market and it, it will, it'll have all kinds of problems and scribs and the company's decline just goes ever further down. It's a death spiral if you don't know how to manage it. So it sounds like your views are fairly complementary. Did you have any areas of disagreement with, with? No, and you know me, I don't have a problem uh, speaking my mind or no, something. I know that. Yeah, and that's uh, why I was kind of curious. <laughs> no, we, we, clash. I, but you know, I've, uh, Jeff and I've, we have certainly bounced into it and talked to each other many, many times over the years. So, um, I, and I know I've pretty much read all those other books. So, um, I think I've read them all actually, uh, at one time or another. Right. So the last thing I want to ask you was, uh, since the book's been out, you've gotten some gut check reactions. What, what have you been learning? Um, well, I would say the biggest one of all is that, um, I keep running into companies who are already celebrating what I would call some transformational success. But the way I would describe it is for a huge number of companies, they're going to have to transform first before they can digitally transform. And let me clarify that. There's a lot of there's and you all on the podcast know if I'm talking about your firm, there's a lot of you that have business processes that if you peeled back the covers, it's like watching sausage or legislation being made. It's a nasty, ugly process and you'd rather prefer no one know about it. And think the sticky notes on the cubicle and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And when I walk around your shop floor and I see magnetic whiteboards to keep track of the status of orders or handwritten parts bin labels and things like that, I know you're not that advanced. And the other problem I keep running into repeatedly was there's Brian, there's only one guy here who knows how to update the MES software. And that's a custom deal that was written some variant of Fortran, you know. So you've got problems. They got to preserve him in like a bubble so he doesn't go outside and thank you. Encounter that's traffic. a good, yeah. yeah. But th- these companies have to transform that mess, that near dysfunctional kind of environment, to get it up to some better steady state, so they can free up some resources and be in, have enough confidence and take the fragility away of their current environment so they can actually do the real digital transformation deal. So I keep running. A lot of folks are patting themselves on the back like, hey, look at us. We we finally have a shared service environment. And yes, that was a big project. Yes, that was transformative to your company, everything else. It made a big difference from an efficiency perspective. It didn't bring any real new business models in. It didn't fundamentally change who you are in the competitive marketplace. It just helped your margins a little bit or prevented you from going out of business. So that's my ca- that's the big thing I've been learning. I didn't write about it. I wrote about it a little bit in the book, but I, I'm realizing now I probably could have written a whole book just on that, you know. And in fact, I'm thinking about penning a piece for like Harvard Business Review with that exact title. Trans- you first, you must transform before you can digitally transform. There you go. Well, Brian, I think we're almost late to whatever our uh, our uh, so what, what do we call them? Our hosts. Uh, Expect us, and we got to get on this. Bike. Yeah, we got to go make a personal appearance now, yeah. and uh, you know, shake some hands, kiss some babies, that kind of stuff. You know, at the shop, at the uh, expo floor. I feel like we, in a way, we just scratched the surface, but I hope listeners got something out of that, and and got got the impression of that that sort of combination of 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 uh, of a sort of view of the market with a methodology that they can go take a, take a look at and put to work. And and even though I don't have a big digital transformation project of that scope, I enjoyed going through the exercises, and I'll probably review those questions again because they're super interesting. So, well, um, 
I know it's a meaty chew, but yeah. uh, but it, I tried to write it as straightforward as I possibly could and not turn into some overly boring deal. One final note, there's a story in there about poaching, and that's the one everyone seems to want to talk about. Mm. And it's it, you're going to think, what's that got to do with digital transformation? Well, go buy the book, find it on Amazon, yeah. and you can read up on that one. I hope you worked wallet fracking, and I can't remember if you did yeah. or not, <laughs> but I hope your, 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 your coined wallet fracking phrase makes an appearance in there. It might be in there. I know. I uh, I used it heavily at the Zoho conference uh, right. a few weeks ago. Yeah, Not about Zoho customers. Though. No, 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 no. It was what uh, I actually yeah. asked people to stand up, and it tell us stories of other vendors that have wallet fracked their corporate bank account. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked by that, but if anyone's listening, it was really cool to hear customers in the middle of a massive like keynote session standing up and testifying to how, how essentially they've been fracked yeah. and, and, and acquired some of the technical debt and the barriers that, that you get into in your book as far as how to overcome. So anyway, we'll leave it there for now, but I'm sure we'll pick up some of the stuff later on. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, John.